Welcome to this lecture about the Austrian composer Clemens Garnstetter. In this lecture, we'll also have some interviews with the composer. You will see them later. Clemens Garnstetter was born in 1966. He is also a trained flutist. He is also known for his close collaboration with the writer Lisa Spalt. Across many of his pieces, his interests are the semantical aspects of music and how they can be transformed and worked with, especially also daily ordinary sounds. Musical iconography, like musical characterization or musical portraits and so on. And also sensation in its many forms, meaning different forms of perception like tactile, cognitive, emotional and logical. All his interests can be found in various multi-layer combinations in his work. I use pieces of him in my classes on vocal music, as well as my regular contemporary music classes. In both classes I used pieces by Ganschetter to talk about references, allusions and quotes and their dramaturgical and musical potential in contemporary music. This is a key topic in my classes and a quite useful perspective for approaching contemporary music. Following his interests, this lecture is structured in three parts. First, some general thoughts that are important for Garnstetter's way of making music. Second, we will talk about meaning and music and how Garnstetter composes with both of them. And third part, so based on the first two parts, we'll talk about simple actions or gestures and how Garnstetter composes with them. So basically simple movements. I will use three pieces only today to give an idea of how Garnstetter works. I will use his ensemble piece Semantical Investigations 2 from 2008 for the second part and this is also the major part of the lecture. For the third part I will use his 2011 until 2016 written string quartet cycle Häuten, Schlitzen, Reißen meaning peel skin off or to skin something, to slit something and to rip apart something and also his 2013 violin solo Moved By. I will introduce them briefly to further present theories already laid out in the first and the second part of the lecture. So the third part will be a rather small one. So here I only provide a first introduction into specific parts of his musical world. I hope I will be able to trigger more interest in his music by doing so. Let's begin with the first part. We'll talk about his way of approaching music and thinking with and in music. Ganschetter himself also expresses those thoughts in lectures and a handful of texts. He is doing this on quite a high level of reflection and links it to us humans as perceiving and culturally understanding creatures. I'm not sure if you would agree, but for me, this also makes him a music philosopher as he asks bigger question of how we act and relate to music and art. Garnstetter was also a student of Helmut Lachmann. Lachmann is not only a highly influential composer, but also a music thinker, so a music philosopher if you want, and author of several essays pointing out the critical role of music for our society, making it philosophy. In Garnstetter thinking, as in Lachmann, there are traces of the philosophy of Theodor Adorno. Music for all three of them, Adorno, Lachmann and Garnstetter, is something essential for our lives. To better understand his music, we need to talk about his music philosophy. For this, I want to introduce a few terms. Hearing and listening, which is not the same. Then the counterpoint as a model or basically also a concept of working. Understanding, mapping, and then the German term Hörstand, which means the current situation of what we can listen to and understand, and sensation. Let's start with hearing and listening. Hearing and listening is not the same. We hear all the time, but Geinschetter states that listening is something we need to learn first. Something we learn like language, like we learn to read. In our environment, we learn, for example, that a specific sound means danger or another sound means you are next in queue. Another sound means new message on your phone or another sound means maybe step aside, a car is coming and so on and so on. Sim similar things are also part of art. There are some basic symbols in music, in fine art, we learn to understand as part of our culture. There are cultural differences in how such sounds are perceived, so not everyone understands them the same way. We can do research on them. 
so we can try to figure out different meanings or the heritage of certain culture-based sounds. This is the case for art sounds as well, as also just for daily ordinary sounds. Both we can do research on. Towards ordinary sounds like bicycle bells, car horns, motor sounds, we usually are indifferent. We do not perceive them as we do art. We don't pay a listening, focused attention to it. But if they are put into art, a piece of music, this can change. They can become both a sound having an ordinary, ordinary meaning and also become musical material. This is something music already does for centuries. We hear post horns in Schubert or Mahler, we hear church bells and so on. We hear heartbeats and many more. All imitated and transformed into music. Let's move on to the term or the idea counterpoint as a model of thinking. In this context, let's make a step into polyphony, semantical and musical. The idea of counterpoint here is that voices are saying something at the same time, but not the same content. Those are two layers of counterpoint. The third layer of counterpoint will be the synthesis of those two layers. So the combination of those two can say something that each voice alone cannot say. The synthesis is more than just the two parts at the same time. This idea will also be part of this lecture. Another major term for Garnstädter is understanding. I try to approach this term based on his idea of it. There are different forms of understanding. First, we understand things with our mind, we analyze, we bring it into our world of references and connect it with the things we already know. Second, there's also a form of understanding with our body, form of sensation. I will clarify further. With certain sounds, textures or dramaturgical build-ups in music, our body might react with tension, makes us nervous or excited. So our body reacts to music and has its way of understanding. Or if there is a musical movement up or down and pitch frequency, um, we might also move a bit into this direction. Or we imagine something's going up or down in ourselves. This is called mapping. We use it for both ways of understanding, the body one and the mind one. Mapping means we experience something and then we transfer it into a context which is understandable and apprehensible for us. In a context we are familiar with and which is referring to our knowledge and cultural background. Mapping is a form of understanding something. Here are some examples. So a map is a mapping of a landscape. It helps us understand our environment and gives us orientation. My Chinese name is a mapping from the perspective of China and Chinese characters. Chinese characters are used to recreate the sound of my original name, but of course also change it and add new layers of meaning. Pinyin is a mapping from a Western perspective and their alphabetical letters onto Chinese language. So mapping is a transformation of something complex or foreign into something more easily apprehensible, a form of analogy. In specific cases, we could also call it translation. We also do mapping in music, especially we musicologists. We might give sound descriptions taken from somewhere else, like daily adjectives, scientific terms, terms taken from visual art or film. We say a melody is sweet or rough, it's high or low, while fast and slow frequency would actually be technically correct. A musical texture might be cold, a texture might be fluent or stuttering. If an ethnomusicologist goes to a minority somewhere and tries to write down their music with the European staff system, he maps what he hears into a world he knows and which is apprehensible for his research purposes. He makes it understandable for him. In a mapping process, things are transformed from its original form to a new form. So things change. Things also get lost. Garnstädter uses a term borrowed and adapted from Adorno. Adorno says there is something he calls Materialstand. Simplified, we can say that this means the current situation and form of the musical material available, not only technical, but also culturally determined and constantly changing. It is part of a current discourse. 
Garnstetter picks this up and refers to a Hörstand, meaning the current situation of what we can listen to and understand. Again, this is based on culture, education, the place where we live and again the current discourse of the specific time and context. The musical discourse inside a composition class is different than the music discourse of a concert audience. The situation of what is available as musical material does not have to be the same as what we are capable of understanding as listeners. Their relation to each other also changes. We now move on to the second part of the lecture. I want to start with a series of works which are dealing with daily sounds and their meaning and also how Gartenstädter works on those meanings. The pieces are called Semantical Investigations 1 and Semantical Investigations 2. They are good examples to get a first idea of how Gartenstädter approaches meaning and how he introduces, organizes and transforms them to also further develop them into an ensemble piece. We will focus on Semantical Investigations 2. For this lecture I did a video interview with Gartenstädter. I will now show excerpts of the interview. They are in English. After the interview excerpts, I will summarize major points of what Garnstetter said and I will add further observations. My first question to the composer was to elaborate his way of working with sounds and their meaning in his music. How to create a form of semantic counterpoint within a piece of music. So how meaning and sound is linked in your piece and how you are working with the meaning as well as the sound at the same time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so at first, maybe we have to uh, stress a little bit that every sound has a meaning. Yeah? So every sound means something to us. There are sounds that have a very strong meaning, like a bell of a bicycle, a cycle bell, yeah, for example, or the, um, the horn of a, of a car. Yeah? And there are, of course, sounds that have uh, different layers of meanings. But the most important thing for me is that when we hear a sound, we do not simply hear it as a kind of acoustic phenomena, but also in its function and in its meaning. So when, when we compose or when I compose, um, the meaning the, uh, and also the context of this meaning are at the same time open to my compositional hands, to, so to what I do to the sounds, is also something that I do to the meaning. Yeah? So I rescribe, uh, transform these meanings. And this is central. And so, for example, if we go for a piece like Semantical Investigations 1, which is a, which is a or let's say 2, <laughs> the second is a little easier to, to describe, is that the whole beginning of the piece starts with the bicycle bell, which is if you go to the acoustic aspect and um, maybe uh, and also to the acoustic context, what you will hear is that there you will hear a lot of different, let's call, uh, let's call it like this, um, um, bells, high bells, bells in A-flat major, um, but they're all coming from the bicycle bell, from the everyday bi bicycle bell. So this is the acoustic aspect. At the same time, the bicycle bell has the, uh, the meaning of go out of my way or uh, attention. Yeah? And uh, so then I can uh, also make a, this uh, open this context that I contextualize attention-like sounds. Yeah? So there will be also sounds that also say attention or go out of my way, like horns of a car, etc. Et yeah? And then there is a next layer that the bicycle has its function and its meaning in a certain context. Yeah? So when you have your bicycle in your apartment and you ring the bell, nobody will step out of the way or will understand it like this. Yeah? But if, if, you're, if, the, if the bicycle bell is contextualized in the situation of the street, then you will react like this. So I also have the, a context or a layer of a context that means the situational context. And the situational context then is, let's say, street. Yeah. So you also will hear maybe at the beginning uh, cars that pass by, etc., etc. Yeah. And then there is the bell aspect. So this kind of uh, aspect, which is culturalized as a bell, 
And there you will hear then different kinds of bells until you also have the, the hour bell. Maybe you know it from uh, especially European or Austrian churches. Every uh, hour we have the bell. It strikes 12 times, 8 times, uh, etc. Yeah? The church bell as itself has, of course, a big, big meaning yeah, and a very variated meaning which is then also a one kind of a bell. And if you go through the whole piece, then you also will come to the context where all the bells then are centralized, where we also have this kind of a theater bell. Uh, in some theaters, when there is the pause, you have dong, 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 you know, or in the uh, cinema. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is um, what you now see is that when I'm working on the contexts, I'm working on various contexts. So not on just one, so the audience of the acoustic context, but the spatial, the uh, semantical, the various ways of semanticals, the situational context, etc. And by these means, I try to get my hands on the meanings and also to create maybe meanings of these bells that are, that we don't know at the moment, yeah, that just the piece is uh, constructing so that we get an artificial meaning that is a meaning for us but is not pre uh, it does not follow a preset that we have in our uh, social collective major points he said were every sound also carries a meaning some quite clear some more subtle or complex we also hear those meanings Darmstadt also uses those meanings to compose for his piece, Semantical Investigations 2, the bicycle bell is his starting point. He then works on the meaning and sounds of different bell sounds. Working on sound and meaning of a bell means he is creating musical and semantical meaning contexts and composes them. That means he searches and composes sounds that are related to the metallic sound of a bell but also are related to the environment of a bicycle bell, so a street situation, for example. He also wants to create new meanings and situations that are not yet existing. He doesn't simply want to imitate the world, but create something new, out of known material, by recombining them in new ways, following the counterpoint idea I presented before. We will now talk about how he organizes these combinations. So it becomes his piece, Semantical Investigations 2. He is creating groups of material following specific qualities and categories, and then using this as his material pool from where he chooses and works with. Can you say a few words about how your groups are designed for especially Semantical investiga Investigations 2? Yeah. Okay, um, for example, there is, um, if we the, the acoustic context, the grouping of the acoustic context, uh, for example, goes uh, in a way of, let's call it very easy, and that's the most easygoing context that we can have similarities. Yeah? What is what is close to this? Yeah? Uh, and then I just simply find, you know, there is the bell, there is then maybe a crotales, uh, which is going, then it goes to a piano, from the piano it goes to an electric guitar. And so I make similarities. It's a little bit like uh, a scale, yeah? but it's of course not a scale, uh, that, I, that I'm, I'm going from the first element to the others. Yeah? At the same time, from the same element, so the, the bell, I make a grouping that is a way of mimetizing this element. Yeah? So I have the brum of the uh, bell as a percussionist makes, does it. Yeah? Then I have the same sound in a, an electric uh, sample. Yeah? So a sample that's played by, by, the, uh, uh, by, by oh, it's also a percussionist in this way. Yeah? And then so I also open a kind of mimetization context and then the next uh, would uh, be for example a, uh, on the keyboard a bell sound, so you know you have a, when you have a, a preset of bells, yeah, and then the same pitches and the same sound as a bell sound in the keyboard, uh, which is the next mimetization of this. And if we then go further, we know that all bells have a specific uh, kind of spectra, yeah? and there are some several steps uh, in between. But then I also have a chord, 
a bell-like chord, which is also a mimetization of the bell, but it's now on the harmonic context. Yeah? So and this is, these are like uh, very in, in very short, these are the groupings, so, uh, or I, I call them scales. Yeah? And then to, yeah, maybe, maybe it's a little too, how to say, uh, it's not so easy, but it's, it's a little bit like uh, when you think of a Mozart melody, he has a C major scale, yeah? uh, but he doesn't make a melody uh, by going through the scale, but uh, under, uh, under specific, um, um, or how do you say, ideas, he groups that, yeah? and this is then a kind of a melody or a kind of, uh, that the pitches follow. And I do it a little bit in this way. Yeah? So I have now my groupings, so these are the scales, or you can also say it's a kind of, a, it's a, it's a kind of material uh, pool. Yeah? But it's, the material pool is organized. It's not, not just sounds, but it sounds on a, let's say it's on a row. Yeah? And then I pick them because I pick, can pick a, a sound from the very end. I can pick sounds that are very close to each other. Yeah? And so, and that then makes also differences in, uh, in the texture of the music, how far sounds are away from the, each other or how connected they seem to be. But of course, on this group, on this line of, they are all uh, connected under certain aspects. Major points he said were, he groups them by similarities in sound, like register, rhythm, spectrum. He creates scales with this material, like a bicycle bell scale that goes from the original sound away towards more abstract imitations of the sound, like from a real bell towards an electric guitar imitating the bell. He uses this scale to compose them. He imitates certain sounds in the context of other sounds, like imitating an aspect of the sound of a bicycle bell with an instrument that does not sound like a bicycle bell. So characteristics of a bicycle bell may be transferred to a percussion instrument, a non-metallic percussion instrument, like a drum. Organizing material and then making scales or rows is something that was used already in serialism and composition ideology from the 1950s. Gangstetter's teacher Helmut Lachmann also has aspects of serialism in his music still. Remnants of this idea are also still in the work of Gangstetter. Would you say this is a style of composition influenced by serial techniques? Um, there, of course, yeah. Uh, of course, this technique knows that there was a serial technique uh, somewhere, somewhere, yeah. Uh, because we know that uh, if you organize um, sounds in a kind of what in German is the wonderful term Abstufung, uh, I just don't get the English different term. Different grades. Yeah, it's, it's about yeah. so gradings uh, of sounds. Yeah, the aspect that I have. Uh, added maybe at least um, well maybe there are also others that added it is that I have different levels of gradings and that the grading and this is totally different than the serial techniques are not quantitative uh, gradings but are qualitative gradings yeah? so all my gradings are uh, qualities and even then because we were talking about semantics semantics so uh, meanings are also qualities yeah? And this is maybe something that um, techniques uh, like um, serial or posterior techniques didn't uh, take in account that much. And of course, I built my technique in a way so that I can also have my hands on all these aspects and all these qualities. Yeah. Gangstetter agrees on having distant connections to serial ideas in his piece, but emphasizes his scales or roles are mainly based on qualities. For those who are familiar with serialism, I recommend to have a look at Stockhausen's electronic piece Gesang der Jünglinge. You will find also scales of qualities there. In some respects, it can be compared to Gansch's concept. Yet, meaning is not graded and put to scales there. This is very specific in the work of Gansch We are still talking about the question of how the material, formed into groups or scales, is used to compose a piece. How are they combined to become a piece? Gangstetter calls this following structures. The structures following the grouping and creation of scales and following also each other. 
linear processes are created by those following structures. Say please a few more sentences on after you grouped your sounds and mm -hmm. your semantic material in rows or whatever post, post serial techniques you mm -hmm. may refer to, how you later combine them. I know mm -hmm. there's like simple combinations like A versus non-A or A-B. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you mm -hmm. just in a few sentences tell me your combination strategy? Yeah, so um, it, it's uh, it's not the same as, um, for any piece because any uh, each, let's say, material and context, they, um, how to say, bring me to some specific forms of organizing sounds after each other. Yeah? Because what, what we have to know is when if we have one sound, and a second sound, they influence each other. So I have to make a kind of a structure how this influence is then organized. And for example, what you named is one of the um, uh, possibilities is that um, I make some kind of a uh, synthesia uh, melody. Yeah. So I have an A, I have a non-A, and then there is a third sound, which is a kind of a synthesis of the two... Uh, for the uh, for first ones, yeah, and this is one uh, thing. So maybe, uh, or you can also say, if I have my row, yeah, a synthesia might also be that I take the first one and the last one, and then one of the middle who has aspects from the first and from uh, the very last in in this kind of row, yeah. So every sound uh, and this kind of contextualization and this kind of um, let's say following structure, then tells us about the organization principle, about the qualities that the row in which uh, the, the sounds are organized um, is the, so let's say about the central quality of this row. And of course, also it tells us something about the internal qualities of the sounds because they are connected and they are, let's say, how to say, they are, uh, Aufeinanderstoßen, they are um, uh, punching, they clash, each, they other, clash yeah. each other, and in this kind of clashing, a different way of, um, let's say, energy get, uh, is then um, ex explodes. Yeah, and you can imagine that sounds that are far from each other might have a different energy than those which are very close to each other. Yeah? And so, and this is, for example, one of the principles. There are other principles. Um, that, for example, in the electric guitar pieces and, and also in the other um, solo pieces that are named, that is uh, for, for portraits, either, you know, whatever portraits, yeah, where I'm taking um, the, let's say, some kind of portrait investigations of these sounds, so that I have, that the sounds have specific, let's say, um, uh, let's say uh, qualities of that I'm taking maybe from a from a face yeah so we have two eyes yeah and our face is more or less somehow a kind of a symmetric thing so these are some symmetric qualities or symmetric symmetric uh, melodies or following structures yeah but at the same time because our face is a gestalt uh, so it's a is 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 um, how to say is uh, not uh, a linear process, but it's also a, uh, how, what's the English word? It's a simultaneous process. Mm -hmm. yeah? These uh, structures then are also uh, referring e to each other in a simultaneous way and are also, you know, from the eye to the nose, it's not the eye is over and then begins the nose, but there is something in between. And this is then also what these kind of melody or following structures then uh, are working on. Major points he said were, for example, he would make a synthesis of two different sounds and meanings, merging them together. He puts them next to each other, creating parallel and different perspectives on the same sound or meaning, like in a Picasso picture. He makes contrasts between different sounds. I will now exemplify the following structures and re-examine the interview we just heard. Let's stick with the bicycle bell. Usually we hear it on the street together with many other noises. Not many people listen to bicycle bells. Maybe bicycle bell designers and producers listen to it. And maybe when you buy a new one and you try to find a sound you like, but normally we don't listen to them. So 
he's making groups and scales based on this bicycle bell. So a bell belongs to the meaning category signal. In the category signal, there are several other signal sounds Gantt that is interested in, like horns, bells, but also human shouting, like go left, don't go in here. And also music, like this bar is open, or advertisement, or a jingle that introduces something, a new product, or whatever. New combinations can be based on movement, emotions, or opposite sounds like soft, hard, high, low, and so on. But also on semantic uh, contexts, like same meaning, or similar meaning, or opposite meaning. Or a situation in the same context, like a motor sound and a car horn or completely different context, like a bathroom or highway. And also time, like same duration, but either faster or slower. All of the things can create different combinations. This is already a composition process. Out of this, he forms motives and themes he then composes with. And here is already a transformation happening. While the context of a bicycle bell might be street noise, it might now be in the context of metallic high-pitched signals, with the other signals may have nothing to do with street noise. In this new context, our bicycle bell is not just a bicycle bell anymore. Its original meaning and context are transformed and more attention is given to its specific sound. Without street context, a bicycle bell gains something more than just being a simple warning signal. This whole process is actually a lot like how the Chinese characters grew over time. They had simple meanings at the beginning of the Shang dynasty, also because the context they were used in was limited. There were not so many different forms of texts when they were used and when they were invented. But then over time, many characters have been taken out of their narrow original meaning and have been transformed into something else. So they have been taken away from their original habitat and have been recombined with other things to form something new. So this process with the growing characters is similar to what Garnstetter does in his pieces Semantical Investigations 1 and 2. Therefore also this title Research on Meaning, Semantical Investigation. He tries to use things we all know to create something new. Because he works on the sounds and their meaning and context. His tools are transformations, recombinations and mappings. Let's have a look on how the transformation of daily sounds into the ensemble piece or onto the musical instruments works. For this question it is important how much the individual signal is transformed. So Garnstetter's ordinary daily live sounds can be recreated as a recording with synthesizers with instruments matching the sounds, but also with instruments not matching the sounds, but matching the rhythm or melody or harmony. So an ambulance horn played a fourth, and in the piece, maybe it's not played by a horn, but by a cello, but still being a fourth. With this material, he creates a semantical and musical counterpoint, a polyphony of sound and meaning. This counterpoint follows also the strategies we already discussed, like movement, emotions, opposite sounds, and so on. Let's look at the first few bars of the piece, Semantical Investigations 2, to show you how he transfers his idea into music. The first few bars are our first sound environment. And there are many such environments in the piece. The first environment deals with the already discussed signal and bell sounds. Imagine an abstract virtual street environment now. This is the semantical setting. In the piece, this first signal sound environment is about 30 seconds only. The whole piece is about 13 minutes. Gartetter organizes the sounds based on first acoustic qualities like length, register, rhythm, second on semantic qualities, so by meaning, and then third by situation, and fourth based on differing grades of mimesis, so how close is the musically recomposed sound to the original sound. Bicycle bell would be close to cotales, for example, which sound almost like a bicycle bell. An instrument more far away, like an electric guitar imitating a bicycle bell, would be on the other side of the scale. Those are our counterpoint voices. Each voice follows some basic models of combination, based on either two or three different types of sounds or meaning. 
based on simple rules of logic. These types can also be wonderful tools of describing other music. They are almost like a music theory. And here's how Garnstedt uses them. First, there are combinations with two elements. There is the negation sequence. So it's A combined with non-A. The term negation here means as far as possible away in the grading scale. In the combinations of sounds, it would be a shrill, high, quick sound and an other sound that is low and slow. In the combination of meaning, it would be a bicycle bell and a motor sound, for example. One is a signal, the other is just a byproduct of movement. Then there's the analysis sequence. So A, which is considered as a composite event, and then analysis of A. A composite event is analyzed by splitting it into parts, creating a form of melody out of those parts. The resynthesis sequence. This is a retrograde version of the analysis sequence. First it is all in parts and then it's built together again to a composite element. Continuation. A becomes a multi-unit sequence by adding other elements or parameters. So like just a chain. Second, combinations with three elements. There's the synthesis sequence. So A, then non-A, and then the synthesis or combination of A and non-A. So two maximum distance sound elements are combined and created a new synthesis element. Then there's the conjunction or connection sequence. So A, then there's a conjunction from A to B, and then there's B. A conjunction has qualities from A and B, but is not a synthesis, more a smooth transition from A to B. All of this can be combined in various ways, including, of course, polyphony. Those are the tools Garnstetter forms his environment with. This does sound like a recipe for composition, and what can be a recipe can also be an analytical tool. Combined with texture type analysis of Lachmann, we would have already a way of structuring polyphonic music out of limited simple material. So this is why I've spent so much time on trying to explain this concept, because it is a useful tool for also other kind of music, classical or of course also other contemporary pieces. I now use an analysis made by Garnstadt himself to show in the score what we have discussed so far. Let's have a look at bar 1 to 7. In the score you see our bicycle bell called Fahrradglocke, German, in the score. It is the very first sound of this piece in the bar 1 in the percussion stuff. And right after you see another bell sound from church service called Ministrantenglocken, also German. Those are the little bells the boys are using in a Catholic church to announce and structure the mass. In a situation context, this has nothing to do with the bicycle bell. There is no bicycle in a church. So it is an A, non-A sequence in terms of situation. In terms of meaning, both are signals. In terms of sound, both are high-pitched bell sounds. So you see these combinations always have different layers depending on which context you use to look at them. This combination of A, non-A becomes Garnstädter's first synthesis labeled with the Greek letter alpha in the score. So we have now A, non-A, and then synthesis of A and non-A. This is already happening in the first two bars of the piece. And it's just one voice out of many voices in those counterpoint. Let's have a look at another voice of the counterpoint, based on situation. Find the two A marks in the score on the first page. Garnstädter imitates motor and honking sounds. On the second page, we hear someone speaking in a megaphone. There is text also. And the keyboard plays pre-recorded sounds of footsteps, all marked with 2A. Those street sounds are also all marked with B and a number like B1, B2 and so on. They all simulate acoustically and semantically a growing distance to a place and become more far away. B is the bicycle bell, B2 the motor, B5 a fragment of music played on street, B6 fragments of a conversation, B6, a B8 the steps and so on and so on. Some of these elements are linked again to each other 
and are following sequence models like we discussed before. Like B7 is linked again to the bicycle bell. They all are elements, so they all are non-A or A in all kind of different contexts. So Garnstedt not only composes those logical sequences, he also puts them into an environment like street and in there he creates situations like someone is moving away or a car passes by. Those environments are not frozen pictures, they are moving sceneries. Let's go to the third voice of the counterpoint, marked with 3a. Here it's all about mimesis. It's about how to imitate a bell in different grades. So the bicycle bell has specific musical characteristics that can be imitated very closely or freer, more abstract. Beginning from sounds very similar to the bicycle bell, we move to other bell-like sounds and then to the piano and so on and so on. This is done in several steps in a scale. I merely pointed out a few details in just a few bars. There are countless and much more complex relations in this chord. All the counterpoint voices are based on very similar, simple material, but each offers a different perspective on it. Imagine a scientist who is looking at a process over and over, every time changing the perspective or way he looks at it. It will enable him to understand his research object better. This is what Garnstedt is doing here, semantical investigations. I did some similar analysis on his vocal ensemble pieces last semester. In case you're interested, I can also provide those lectures to you. I now want to move on to the third part of the lecture. Let's first listen to Garnstedt himself again. Until now we talked about how to transfer daily sounds into music. I ask him now to talk about how to transfer actions into music and how this is done in his string quartet cycle Heuten, Schlitzen, Reißen. Maybe you can also say a few more things. What we talked about now was basically actually sounds you would work with, with their certain meaning, their different ways of categorizing them and so forth. There is also a cycle of three string quartets, which are not based on at first sounds, but rather on actions, which of course are related to sounds then later. But can you maybe tell us something about how you work with such actions instead of sounds? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... I'm very sure uh, that if I give you a word, for example, um, and uh, excuse me, these are the examples that are coming from the string quartets, yeah, that you have connected uh, inner sounds with those actions that I will tell you now. Yeah? A knife cutting through the flesh of a um, tomato or uh, whatever, fruit. Yeah? Uh, if and also, if you think of the um, uh, of the knife itself, you know, of the sharpness and the material and the metal, you will have a sound that is connected to this. Yeah. If you think of, um, for example, what you feel if a knife is going over your skin, you will have a sound connected to this. And of course, you will have a sound connected to this if you maybe cut uh, or something cuts your. Uh, skin yeah you also will produce a sound maybe you scream yeah? or you do something like this yeah and so uh, the whole theory or the whole my whole investigation is that uh, sounds or we have to everything in the world we have something or not everything but too many things in this world we have inner um, ideas of sounds inner projections of sounds. On the other side, and now I'm turning it upside down, if we hear something, we say this sound is sharp, this sound is high, so sharp means it's, it's spicy, high is it's a projection into the room. We say maybe it's rough or it's like the knife, it's, uh, it's also sharp, which is also then tactile, so it's a, a projection on our skin. And if we put all these together and we do this when we perceive a single sound, as you maybe hear this uh, kind of uh, machine outside my house now, because there is some craftsmen's uh, work outside, you will project this as the power of the machine, the drilling of, of it, and then when we do all this together, we do this, and this is what I call understanding of a sound. And in composing, I just turn this understanding of the sound upside down, and I'm putting uh, qualities or these kinds of 
we have this uh, wonderful word in German, which is Empfindungen. In English, they say or uh, often sensation, which is a little bit too narrow in the in the whole aspect. What an Empfindung uh, really would be, but let's let's say it's sensation. I can have a sensation and bring it to a sound. And if you think of the string quartet, yeah, there is so much so much idiomatics in the uh, in the way a bow is uh, is. Uh, you make it bow strike or if you think of the tactility of a bow on the string it's like a, a, a it's like a hand on another hand yeah? and this is what I'm working on on these string quartets on yes um, quite um, let's say on groundings and also obsessions that I have in my head since years and years which are also groundings of let's say European cultural history so the flaying of Marsyas by Tizian, also the, uh, the uh, crucifixion of Grünewald in the uh, Isenheimer Altar, and then not a single one, but some pictures of uh, Francis Bacon. These pictures are not there uh, to, to, to bring them to sound, but they are just, let's say, my, this is, um, this is the world that I'm working in, because, you know, if I'm working with these sensations, it could explode to everywhere. Yeah? And so I get my limitation by these kinds of uh, works that somehow follow, that I'm following since decades. Nature points, he said, were some actions are connected with sounds, like knife and like a knife cutting through a fruit. But also we connect sounds to the knife itself, its sharpness, the metal. Even so itself, it does not have a sound, of course. Those are inner sounds or inner ideas of sounds. This is a form of mapping. The other way around, we also can say that some sounds are sharp, metallic. A stringly sound might be like a cutting knife. He takes a few major actions like to cut, to slit, to skin or to tear apart and projects them onto a string quartet. He also combines this with other inspirations from European cultural history to create a more dimensional piece. He mostly uses paintings. He takes the actions from before and works on those paintings and tries to, try, tries to explore the paintings by applying those actions. We will see them later also. The first of the three string quartets is dedicated to the action of skinning or to skin something. The second is dedicated to the action of slitting or cutting something. The third is dedicated to the action of rip apart something. For all three pieces, Garnstetter addresses a tactile perception of sound. The listener should feel the sound with the bodies, a form of sensual sensation. The string quartet works on those sensations and tries to skin or slit or rip with their bows the strings. So the bow of the string instrument touches the strings like as if those strings are skin. They musically peel it off. It's a form of mapping, of course. Ganstetter further redefines the instruments. The string instruments are not bowed or plucked instruments anymore. They are skinning, slitting or ripping instruments now. But Ganstetter also transforms those initial action to other sensations beyond skinning, slitting or ripping. Like in his semantical investigations, the string quartets investigate specific action actions and what they can become in art. All those actions naturally not only are linked to an imagined sound, but also to movements. Those movements again, of course, are either real or imagined. And again, also sound carries a virtual movement in it already. This is one of the forms of sensation and body-based understanding I introduced in the beginning. And of course, mapping again. All of this is also developed out of the string quartet and its sound material and accumulated history. Bernstetter is aware of that. He tries to avoid traditional string quartet phrases and idioms, yet uses mainly standard playing techniques. The string quartet remains a string quartet, yet the instruments become his tools um, creating the actions he intends to. A dialectical approach on the string quartet as a very complex and complicated art form. The piece is also inspired by paintings, as we heard before. Tizian's flaying of Marsyas, or actually skinning of Marsyas, and 
Matthias Grünewald's Crucifixion. Both are cruel pictures where skin is perforated. Those paintings are like artistically transformed extreme versions of skinning or cutting. Francis Bacon and his strangely deformed, uncanny screaming Pope portraits are another inspiration. To further lay out his interest in sensation and movement, I also want to briefly have a look at his solo violin piece Moved By. The title of the piece sets the agenda. It's about the movement of the musician and its relation to the movement of the music. Not necessarily they are equal. Small movements of a violin player can create sound. But as a movement they can also create imaginations beyond the literally produced sound on the instrument. And beyond that again also sensations. Sensations are not only triggered by sound but also by visual acts of movement by the musician. Counterpoint like strategies can be used again here. Like the sensation what you see versus the sensation what you hear. In this piece we can also observe again our own mapping of music. The music evokes smooth textures, ripping like actions, soft finger tipping, gliding and many more. It can be seen as a form of the focused summary of some of the core topics of the lecture. There are many other pieces, also quite different in style and context. I also highly recommend having a closer look at Granstetter's writing for vocal music and electric guitar. I hope to spark some interest for further listening and research on the music of Clemens Granstetter. That was the goal of this introduction lecture here. The final words of this class shall also be Granstetter's. I ask him what he is working on currently. He said he's working on different forms of sensation again, how humans perceive music. He asks himself what kind of sensations and feelings only music or art in general can create. In those investigations he aims for something new, pointing towards utopian ways of perception. But in his words now. Okay, last question now. What are you working on now? What is your last interests you're trying to explore in your pieces? Oh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, well, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm on now is, uh, of course, what I'm, what we were talking about now about this kind of sensations, about these um, aspects of, I would say, very, very. Um, hmm, I'd like to call it some kind of a. It's an anthropological uh, investigation. What what my music is. So I'm investigating us, me, being in this world in terms of sound, but not just investigating me being in this world, but also, uh, and this is what music can, we do develop a different way from what, what I see and how I see, for example, me, uh, going into some kind of a utopian way, yeah? Of something or just searching for something that is that is just able being able uh, to be um, to be uh, communicated via music so some kind of sensation some kind of let's call it feeling I don't know if a feeling is the right word huh? but something that we experience which is simply just possible via music and I'm now talking about but we can also say arts yeah taking its grounding on the very, very fundamental states of what we are, of how I perceive, of my perception, of my being in the world, of my world. Yeah. So uh, also the, the noise that you heard is, is something that, um, that is, could be kind of a starting point. And this is something that I'm working very in, in very general uh, now. Um, in this kind of anthropological research, which doesn't mean that I'm centralizing humans in this world, that they are the most important things in this world, but I'm, you know, I can perceive the world just from what I am. Yeah? But of course, um, me in this world, this is the big point. And if I transform me, I'm transforming the world, etc., etc., and into something unknown, which is just possible in art. And this is what I'm working on in kind of big projects, in kind of uh, solo pieces, in something that I'm going to write, kind of a song cycle uh, with keyboard and so no piano, 
but keyboard and um, different, different maybe a piano concerto, maybe a, uh, something like a flute concerto is some somehow in the pipeline, uh, and yeah, things like this. <laughs>